Hello, it's James from xrobots.co.uk. This is part eight of my BB-8 version three build. Last time I started to flesh out putting electronics in and I also built the remote control. That was quite an in-depth episode to set the foundation for what I'm attempting to do here. And today, hopefully I'm gonna wire some stuff up, do some coding and get it driving around at least in one or two axis. The main plan is to use the inertial measurement unit to stabilize it electronically so it's not wobbly and I'm going to start by doing the side-to-side -side axis. But first of all, let's have a quick look inside. So here's what we had from last time. I built this Bluetooth remote, and I'm using Bluetooth so that I can write a smartphone app in the future, because that's pretty much the only thing on phones. So I've got an Arduino Pro Mini and a Bluetooth transmitter, four joysticks, so I've got enough for all the axis, and various switches there, and I demonstrated the comms, just chucking that out to a USB to serial converter. So in the uh, droid itself we've got some batteries i had information on those last time we've got two motor drivers on this side and a power distribution strip and on the other side we've got an arduino mega another power um, power driver basically another motor driver which is the bts 7960 and the wires conveniently come out of there for the main drive motor so that's going to be the one for that two more batteries and another power strip so these batteries are going to be wired in parallel to give me 12 volts and then further regulation will take that down to five and six for the servos. On the other side, those batteries are gonna be series up to give me 24 volts to drive the main drive motor and um, the side to side motor and this flywheel motor, which isn't fitted yet. So the only thing I have done since last time, which wasn't in the last video, was fit some little switches here. So these are gonna be the enable switches for each of these motor drivers so that I can switch them on and off independently. And that's a logic level enable, which goes into some enable pins on here. I've also got one around the other side as well on this one, exactly the same. And I can actually drive that from a logic level enable out of the Arduino if I wish to. So I could have um, one of these actually enables all the motor drivers and switches them off again, which could be quite useful. Um, but uh, there will definitely be hardware switches so I can turn off individual motors for diagnosis. I've also got some other switches fitted, you'll notice up here, and these are gonna be the ones that switch the actual batteries on. So one will be for 12 volts, the other is to cut powers to all of the head control arm servos, and on the other side, I've got another one there, which is gonna be for the 24 volts on and off. So I need to wire these up, put some fuses in, then we need to write some code, which is going to talk to the inertial measurement unit, which is the MPU 6050. And that is gonna be fitted right in the middle in there. And then we can use the Arduino to read this, read the sticks, and hopefully make everything stable. So that is the challenge today. Right, I spent a little bit of time wiring some things in. So first of all, we're gonna look around this side. So you can see I've done some stuff to the motor wires. So these are the ones that are in series. So these go out and in, and the connectors deal with the series connection. I've got my big blade fuse in there and I've got this power switch that then takes power over to my power distribution strip. So if I switch this one on, we should be able to see a little display in there. I don't know if you can just see it. Let's move the wires. That should tell me the voltage there. So that's monitoring the batteries. I've got 23.14 volts. So tiny bit low, they'll need charging, but um, that is seriesing both of them up and that gives me power positive and negative on this rail and I've just dropped a bit of wire in and soldered it across to some of the terminals and then dropped that down to the motor drivers and I've already wired in the motor for the trousers for that side to side axis the other one will be for the flywheel which doesn't exist yet so far these are not wired in if we go back to the other side you can see I've also wired in the batteries there and those are wired in parallel so if I turn this one on I've got another little display there which should say uh, 11.58, so nearly 12 volts. Again, those batteries aren't fully charged. I've also got a fuse and another switch that when I switch on will give me 12 volts to go off to the regulators for the servos, which are six volts. And I mentioned I've got these power regulators last time, one for each servo. So there's another negative wire hanging around there and the positive is on here. So on this side, again, we've got the motor driver and that gets the uh, 24 volts from the other side. There's also a five volt regulator in there. Let's just zoom in and try and get that in shot. So the thing tucked away there with the blue light on is a five volt regulator. 
and that's wired to both sides as well of this terminal strip a bit further up and that will power the Arduino, the IMU, any LEDs in the ball and so on. So the last thing I can do before I can get programming is wire in some power to the Arduino and also wire in those enable switches. I'm just wiring in my inertial measurement unit there which is the MPU6050 and I've wired to the VCC and ground and this one is 5 volt tolerance and so are the data lines, it has an onboard regulator. So the next two SCL and SDA are the I squared C pins which goes to the Arduino and the one nearest the camera is the green wire which is the interrupt pin and that pin is responsible for saying there's data in the buffer, come and get me please. Alright so I've wired quite a few things in, you can hopefully see the MPU6050 right in there with its power light on just at the top. So that is wired into power and it is also wired to the I squared C pins. Now a lot of stuff is concealed behind wiring here, so I've got another Arduino Mega. The top two pins on the left there are the I squared C pins which have to be wired the correct way round and they are labelled on both boards. Um, um, the other pins on the left there are the other UART serials, so the Bluetooth interface which is piggybacked on here, just see it's red light flashing, I've stuck that to the Arduino with tape, as well as getting power from my power distribution that is wired to the second UART, uh, which is the um, RX1 and TX1, and the RX0 and TX0 are wired to the USB port which we use for programming in Diags. Now I've wired in um, 5 volt power to my motor drivers and it's the same with the ones on the other side and I've got all of those six wires are basically wired in there and those are the PWM outs that I'm going to use. Uh, digital 2 goes to the MPU6050 which is the interrupt pin I mentioned. So um, in terms of the, the uh, enable wire there on the motor driver, so I've got this switch installed now. So I have um, the Arduino pin digital 31 which is right at the top. There's a white wire and that wires to these switches. Um, it's the same with the ones on the other side as well, which are just here. That's the same wire that runs all the way over. So that is the soft enable for those motor drivers. And that means I can switch it on digitally with a switch on the handset. And then I've also got hardware control over that as well. And the other things on here are 5 volts and ground and also the PWM in, as I mentioned, go to these pins here. So I think everything is wired in there. Let's have a look at some code for the inertial measurement unit. So I've moved the droid to next to the computer. So I've got it on this mat here, it's on the table. The tabletop's a bit broken, so that sound isn't the droid breaking, it's actually the tabletop which is delaminated. So that's what the creaking sound is. But basically I'm running the same code I showed last time for the MPU6050. I've got those X and Y coordinates showing on the screen there. As I move the droid around, we can see the data changing. So let's have a closer look at that code. So here I am running that code again, and if I move the droid around, we can see that those axes vary. That's positive, about 20 degrees, negative an amount, and then the other axis. So we can have plus minus 20, moving that around. Obviously it goes to 90 degrees either way, which hopefully we won't achieve. And you can hear the table um, cracking in the background there as I'm moving it around. So um, as I said in the last part, this is part of I squared C devlib, which is open source. Um, this is the MPU6050 class using uh, DMP, the Motion Apps version 2. And I should credit Jeff Roberg here, who appears to have written this. He's released it under the MIT license. Not sure if he's associated with MIT, but basically the license says you can pretty much do anything with this um, as long as you keep the copyright notice intact, which I will do. So um, effectively what this does, as far as I can tell, is causes the board to do some onboard processing to combine its accelerometer and gyro. So it's much like the BNO055 I did last time, but um, without the magnetometer. So um, this is currently maintained, it's been updated um, not too long ago and um, uh, we're just going to quickly look through the code, I won't go into too much detail. I've actually edited this down, it did quite a few more things like giving the data in different types of coordinates like Euler angles and various other things. As it is I've just got the um, basically the real world 
angles out in degrees for this sensor so um, it does require libraries to be installed the i squared c dev library mpu 6050 the wire library for i squared c um, and so on so if you install all the libraries that come with this package you should have everything so it also tells you how to wire it up it mentions that it's 3.3 volts mine is on a board as i say with um, 5 volt tolerant lines and a 5 volt regulator so um, and obviously it does need this pin too wide for the interrupt pin and that's what triggers it there's no timing in here it's using actual timing on the board and when the the uh, fifo buffer has data in it then triggers that interrupt pin and the code runs to go and get it so there's a lot of stuff in the setup here this is the interrupt detection routine so that's what makes it run as far as i can tell so um, this is more of the setup this is setting up a serial port to write the data out to a terminal Obviously doing that takes some time in the loop, which um, eventually I will remove the rights to the serial port because I don't need to monitor the data. And that will speed my loop up and stop that FIFO overflowing. But uh, basically if we um, scroll all the way down here, the main program loop is identified fairly clearly. Um, it's not too long. Um, it does deal with buffer overflows by resetting the FIFO. But ultimately uh, what we've got here reading the uh, readable your pitch roll i've deleted the uh your i believe so i've only got pitch and roll which are two values in an array um there's some maths going on there with pi and 180 degrees but basically those are the serial lines that's writing that data out so if i go and initial that uh, initialize that serial port again we get some stuff saying it's initialized and then we get the x and y coordinates now i've clocked this down to 50 hertz what you need to do in order to do that is go into the libraries in your program files Arduino libraries folder, find the motion apps 20.h, and I've already made several other copies there that I was editing and playing around with. And if we get that file in Notepad or some other text editor, uh, we need to find this part here that says inset FIFO rate. And there's some stuff commented um, out below that that basically says uh, what these values are. So I've made that a three, which is 50 Hertz. Uh, which isn't documented here, but I googled it and found out. So if you set it to uh, a 9, then it's 20 hertz, a 7 is 25 hertz, and so on. So that clocks the data right down so that my loop doesn't run as quickly, and hopefully it doesn't overflow as, as quickly. And as I say, I will be taking those serial writes out, which will speed it up. But we can test this by putting a pointless delay in. So if I put a delay in at the bottom here of 20 milliseconds and reprogram my Arduino, and once that's programmed, we then run the serial monitor again. We should see the odd buffer overflow. I don't know if you saw that go past. It says FIFO overflow, and that's what that text is going up. So obviously 20 milliseconds is too long. So all my code's got to run within 20 milliseconds or less. And as I say, I will take those serial writes out, which will speed things up a bit, but that's gonna be the plan. And if obviously that's not uh, enough time then I'll have to reduce down the frequency from 50 Hertz to 25 or something like that but I don't really want to do that. The next thing that needs to happen is getting data from my remote control into some variables in that code and being able to deal with sort of flow control to make sure that doesn't overflow and works properly and also getting the data out of the potentiometer I fitted to measure how far the trousers are swinging backwards and forwards. Well, I've just made a small modification to the transmitter. So what I found is these Bluetooth modules have what's called the state pin, which is this pin right on the end. And that goes low when it's not paired and high when it is paired. So if you follow this yellow wire round, I've wired that to pin eight of my um, Arduino Pro Mini. And I've wired an LED and a resistor there to pin nine. So if I now turn this on, we should see it power up. We can see that the uh, pairing light there, or the light on the Bluetooth module is flashing fast. My LED is off, but if I turn the droid on, it should start to pair. My green LED flashes, then it comes on. So basically what's happening is there's a while loop running, which is uh, waiting for that status to come high. And it's waiting, then it flashes the LED, and basically then it starts transmitting data. So it's not just smashing data out as soon as I turn it on, it's starting it cleanly when the other end is ready. So basically it waits for that status, waits for a little bit of time for things to settle down, then it starts transmitting data. And if it becomes unpaired, so if I turn the droid off, every time the loop goes around it checks, so it turns off the LED, 
and then it goes back and runs that function again, waiting again for the droid to come and be paired, waiting a bit of time and then cleanly starting the data. Let's quickly check that code for the handset. So what we've basically got is, um, after I've declared all my variables, I've got a function called pair, and that's the function that waits for the handset to be paired with the droid. So it turns the LED off, and then does a while loop that says basically while that state pin is zero, then uh, just go round and round waiting. So it doesn't do anything else other than read that pin on digital read eight. And eventually the state will then become more than zero and it will carry on. So then it flashes the LED a bit with some delays, turning it on and off, eventually turns it on. And then it goes down and runs that main loop, transmitting the data. I've also taken the opportunity here to scale the data, so turn it up the other way so that when you push the stick up it gets bigger, and I've scaled it down from 10 bit to plus minus 8 bit. So the PWM drive will only deal with a maximum 8 bit value, so 0 to 255, so I've scaled my value to be between 0 and 512, which I actually send to the droid because there's no point in dealing with any bigger numbers. On the start of every loop to transmit the data, it checks again to see um, basically if that data, uh, if that pair pin is high. And, and if it's not, then it runs the pair routine again, so it stops sending data, goes back to run this function, and when it's uh, paired again, then it can cleanly start sending the data. So going back to the droid code, I've made some modifications. So uh, basically starting at where that code ended, it was serial printing that yaw and pitch out. I've now put those into variables, which are both floats, and I'm printing those out to the serial console. Um, I'm then checking for serial to be available, and you'll notice this is on serial one, and that is uh, one of four UART serials, and this is the one connected to the Bluetooth receiver. So that is um, going through the data here, um, doing what's called a serial parse int, which is a parse integer, and it's stripping out those values which are comma delimited one by one and putting them into variables called channel one through six and button one through six. You'll notice I've labeled button four as the enable pin, which I'll talk about in a minute. It then looks for the new line character at the end. At the moment, it doesn't actually do anything other than continue, but there will be a timestamp in here, so I'll be able to stamp the time and then do that a safety check, basically, to check that if the time's been too long since data is received, it can basically disable that enable pin to the motor controller and stop the droid, because it probably means the remote control's been disconnected. For now, it just prints those out to the USB serial, which is UART0. So it prints all those out so I can see them. And again, I've noted that button four is the enable pin. I'm then reading that trousers potentiometer that I fitted last time, so that's plugged into analog zero, and I'm printing that out to the terminal. And then here I'm actually reading that Bluetooth state to see whether it's paired again on the receiver Bluetooth module, and that's connected to pin 33. So what I've said here, um, there's an if statement, so when I press the buttons, they go to zero, and when you don't press them, they're at one, and that's because they're input pull up on the transmitter. So basically, if button four is pressed and the Bluetooth state is one, which means it's paired, then it digital writes to pin 31, and that is the enable pin, which goes out to those other physical switches and then to the enable pins of the motor drivers, and also prints the word enable to the terminal so I can do some diags and see what's happening. But I've explicitly stated if the button is one, which means it's not pressed or switched, or the Bluetooth state is zero, so one of those or the other, then it will uh, write low, so it will turn off the enable pin and turn off all the motor drivers. So if the remote becomes disconnected or it times out, then it will stop the droid, and that's quite an important safety feature. I've also got a delay in here, which is currently commented out, but this is how much time I've got left in the loop. And of course, I will be commenting out all these serial writes, which take time, although I could write these back over Bluetooth to the transmitter. So I could put a little display on there that actually transmits and shows me the pitch and yaw, or I could um, basically have fault LEDs for overflow and other things that get written out. But for now, if I go and open the serial monitor, we can see all this data getting written out. So we've got pitch and roll there identified, and if I move that droid around on the table there, you can see those are giving me actual values. At the moment, I've got the potentiometer is fixed at about 570, but if I wiggle the trousers, I can get some slight variation. Obviously, it's locked solid at the moment. And you'll notice, importantly, I've got disable right there, because it's not paired and I haven't switched the switch. But if I now turn on the transmitter, we wait for that to pair. 
here it comes we suddenly get lots of data so now if I wiggle all my controls you can see that we get all of the data there and so this is transmitting over Bluetooth to the Arduino Mega in the droid and then being put into variables and printed back out over USB to this terminal. So the droid has definitely got the data in these variables. And if I press the buttons one by one, we can see those ones changing to zero. And if I flick the button four, then as well as that going to zero, we now get enabled. So that's taken that pin high, which goes to the motor drivers. And I've still, of course, got those hardware switches to switch to, to actually turn them on. So let's have a look at the droid in real life. That's switched on at the moment, and I've still got my data there being streamed to my console. And that's because I've got a USB cable plugged in, which is plugged straight into the PC there. So that's actually reading data straight out of that Arduino. So uh, now if I go and turn on my... Uh, transmitter so let's grab that and we'll go and power that on and wait for it to pair so wait for our green light there it goes and then we go and have a look at the screen again we can now see we've got that data so if I go and wiggle some controls you can see that that's working which is good so uh, I mentioned that enable pin and that's actually this toggle which is here and you'll notice a blue LED turns on inside the droid. Hopefully you can just see that. And that is my enable pin. So the only way to turn that on is when this is paired and I switch this switch. That turns on the enable pin that turns on all the motor drivers and then they've all got their own independent switches. So I can turn them off if I want to for diagnosis. But now we've got all that data in the droid, what are we going to do with it? So we need to use it to stabilise the droid and drive around and so on. So driving forwards and backwards, of course, is this way. And that's quite an easy problem to solve. Obviously, it stands up on its own, so it's not like a two-wheel balancing robot or a ball balancing robot that constantly falls over. So we just need to use that IMU data to stabilise it. So as I push the stick forward, that makes a set point, which uh, brings the mass forward to a certain amount of degrees, probably up to about 30 at full speed and it tries to maintain that position so it doesn't wobble. And as it speeds up and slows down, it tries to maintain zero and it'll compensate for us. And this is already done in version two. What's more interesting is the side to side stabilization. So um, initially that would seem to be a similar problem. I've got this axis that can swing sideways, but of course it can't keep driving sideways. So eventually it has to return to the middle. So um, the simple way to think about that would be that perhaps if it starts to wobble, it moves the mass the other way and then that pulls it back again. The problem with that is that it'll probably overshoot and then it'll wobble the other way and the mass goes out this way and it'll kind of end up oscillating doing this sort of thing. So we need to avoid that. So what we probably want to do instead of doing that is push the mass in the direction it's going. So we could have it so it was really sloppy so it kind of gently brings it back in and if it leans this way it brings the mass out and gently brings it back. But that'll probably overshoot as well. So what I think we need to do is push that mass out quite strongly like a reaction wheel. So as it falls this way, it goes oh, like this and pushes itself back and it's very fast and under control so that then it stabilizes and doesn't oscillate. So what we've got um, is the potentiometer that reads the position of this axis. We've also got the inertial measurement unit which reads the position of the ball. We've got the stick position, which is me leaning left to right and we've got the output of the motor. So how are we going to deal with all those things? So if I was just driving one motor and I had the IMU and I had my remote control, then basically I have a PID controller in here and that has an input, an output and a set point. The output goes to the motors and the set point is basically coming along here. So that would be my stick saying drive at a certain speed. So that would be the set point. And then I'd have some form of feedback that would feed back from the actual droid and that would be my input, and that would be the IMU. So then the PID loop would try and match basically the angle in the IMU to my set points to try and drive the motor at a constant speed. And obviously this is looping around 50 times a second, so it's reading the angle 50 times a second, reading the set points, which comes from this stick, and it's trying to drive that motor and adjusting that motor speed 50 times a second to try and get the actual angle of the droid to match where I set the stick. And that's why it stays so stable. But when I'm doing the side-to-side -side axis, I've also got that potentiometer, which measures the difference between the cheese and the trousers. 
and I need to take that into account, so how am I going to do that? So what I'm in fact going to do is use one PID controller to turn that wiper motor that moves the trousers sideways into a giant servo. So that's going to take the motor on the output, it's going to have the potentiometer, which is going to be the input, which measures the difference between the banana and the trousers. Obviously the banana is locked to the cheese, so it basically measures the difference between those two bits of hardware. And the set point, which comes in here, could be this stick. So at that point, if I move the stick sideways, we should find it leans and it stays at that angle, just like moving a radio control servo with a radio control controller. But then what we need to do is introduce the inertial measurement unit. So we need another PID controller, which is gonna feed that one. So that's gonna sit up here. Its output will come down here. Its input will be the inertial measurement unit, which sits on here. And its set points will in fact be the joystick. like so. So this one is going to give me control over the angle I need to get to and it's going to stabilize with the inertial measurement unit. And this one is essentially going to drive the motor and that will be responsible for how fast it gets there in response to the actual angle it needs to get to. So I'm going to implement this part first, then I'll go on to implement this part. I've coded the first PID loop up, so I've included the PID library there, which is from playground.arduino.cc slash code slash PID library. This is the one that I use all the time. So down in our declarations here, we've declared some variables for P, I, and D, and also the set point, the input, the output, and another staging variable, which I'll talk about shortly. And then we've declared our PID there, and I've called it PID1 with those variables. Now down in the setup, we've then got the setup for that. So we've said it's automatic. Output limits are plus minus 255. And the sample time is 20 milliseconds, which is basically 50 times a second. So that's the speed this whole loop runs. Then at the end of the, the end of the code here, I've tacked on some maps and constraints. So I've taken the pot and made that the input. I've made my channel two on the remote, which is the side to side channel, that's my set point. And I've constrained these and mapped these to, the, to scale them to the right value. And basically both of those are plus minus 45, which stops that trousers and the flywheel crashing into the middle of the droid. So that basically puts a, a sort of soft end stop really, or hard end stop on the, on the droid. And then all we have to do is PID1 compute, and then the output we can use to drive the wheels. So I'm printing out some of the data to the serial terminal so I can see what's going on. But basically it says if the output is uh, smaller than minus one, then drive the wheels one way. And if it's bigger than one, drive them the other way. And if it's between one and minus one, then um, analog write zero to both, so it stops. At the moment, there's no discernible dead spot. Uh, minus one and one is not a very big value to drive the motor with, but I could increase that if I wanted to. Now I'm doing the uh, output here is output one, and I'm turning that into output one A. And I found if I didn't do that, then sometimes um, the value seems to fluctuate from positive to negative. So it must be um, for some reason, um, using these ab statements to turn it up the other way sometimes and it's skipping a loop or something. So I'm not quite sure exactly why, but basically if I stage the variables, so I'm not using output all the way from the output of the PID loop to driving the motors, then it doesn't do that anymore. Um, and I've had to do this before, so anyway, it seems to work, so let's have a look and see how it works. All right, so here it is. I've got it all powered on, so I've got my remote, and if I switch on my enable switch, you should be able to hear that annoying PWM sound, which I will get rid of, probably by increasing the dead spot and also by turning up the frequency, so it's not audible anymore, but I haven't done that yet. So now if I move my stick, and this is just acting like a servo, it will lean that way, and if I come the other way, it will come the other way. And obviously it's really wobbly because there's no stabilisation, but you can see that's pretty responsive. And if I just grab this, hopefully you can see that's... Uh, going as fast as it can to match the place where I put the joystick, just like a servo, but not overshooting, so the PID loop is tuned up pretty well. And I can shift the weight around quite a bit to get quite a bit of lean. In fact, I can tip it over, so I have to be quite careful. So that's yeah, manually trying to stabilize if I wobble it and then wiggle this at the right time doing a very good job of it, we should be able to 
try and stabilize it. But now I need to stabilize it automatically by reading the IMU and doing that so it stays stable. So now I've added my second PID controller and I've declared that under the first one. So that one is called PID2. And I've commented there that it's for the trouser stability. So I've also um, initialized that PID controller there, the same output limits, same sample time. The only difference is at the bottom of my code, and you'll notice I've commented out all my serial prints now. I can uncomment any of those I want to see for diagnosis, but I've taken them out to, so it doesn't slow the loop down. So now what I've got is another PID2 compute, which is this line. But before that, I've said the input to that PID controller is the role of the IMU. And I've inverted it by uh, multiplying it by minus one. I've also added eight to it to try and balance the droid up. So mechanically, it's not perfectly balanced. And also the IMU doesn't give me exactly zero when it's zero. So I've added a number to compensate. And the set point for that IMU is channel two of the stick. So apart from that, it does the PID compute. The set point for PID1, which is the servo PID, is the output from this second PID, and the rest is the same pretty much. So let's see how that works. So I have of course realised one fundamental flaw in my plan, and thanks to those who pointed it out in the comments from the video from last time, I did have my inertial measurement unit mounted on the trousers, and of course that is not the right place, because the inertial measurement unit should be on the thing I'm trying to stabilise, not the thing I'm trying to stabilize it with, otherwise it will be a moving target and it will never catch up. So I've now extended the wires for the IMU and I'm going to mount it on that white platform between the servos and that is attached to the banana stroke cheese so it actually moves with this, not with the trousers moving side to side, really important. So let's put that in the right place and now see how it works. I've now tuned up those PID controllers, so obviously one of them will control what angle it moves to and the other one will tune how fast it moves there. And I can tune those to be more or less aggressive in each case by altering the I and D values in each PID controller. So I've got quite a lot of control now over those trousers. So now we're going to compare with unstabilized and stabilized. At the moment the enable pin is off on my remote, so I'm going to give this a shove and obviously as you'd expect it will rock backwards and forwards for quite some time and this is on a smooth board again so that we've got no other dampening. So if I give that a rock and now turn on the enable pin, we should find it stabilizes itself out pretty quick. So I'm overcompensating a little bit, so sometimes it gets stuck in one position. I probably need to undercompensate so it always returns to the middle, but uh, nonetheless the principle is there of stabilization. So that, that works pretty well. So again let's just compare that with unstabilized and stabilized it works pretty well there we go I seem to have killed it within mostly half an oscillation so um, I can also of course control the set point still with this stick so I can still lean manually whichever way I want to at some point the uh, trousers get to as far as they can go and then obviously there's no way of compensating in both directions because they hit um, the end stop denoted by that pot. But I'm um, pretty sure when it's in motion and it's driving it's going to stand on its edge like a bicycle wheel anyway so there's not going to be so much wobble when I steer around corners. And with the head on I'll be able to lean further and so on as well. But there we go. That's pretty much working I think. So importantly, what I've got now is control over those two PID controllers, so I can change the speed at which the motor moves to the position, how far it moves in response to the inertial measurement unit, and how aggressive it is in both cases. So I should have total control over that side-to-side -side stability now. And of course that's going to change as I come and put the head on, which is going to make it more top-heavy, and I do various other things to it, so I'm going to need to keep retuning those variables. But I'm pretty happy I've got total control, even though it doesn't look that impressive now. It should make it inherently stable, so that wobble doesn't build up in the first place and that's really the key to driving around in a stable fashion. So next time I'm going to hopefully get it driving so we just need one PID controller to control it to drive forwards and backwards. The flywheel motor will come later because I know that will work, that's just for spinning so that doesn't even have any IMU control and hopefully next time I can get the head moving as well so we can get a fair idea of how this thing is going to perform once it's in motion. So don't forget to subscribe to my channel for more updates on this project and other projects, and also check out the social media links in the description to this video.